Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here and today you'll be taking on the role as a hero fighting an unfair battle against one of three dragons which are scourging Euthia. But the land is also tormented by a horde of monsters which arise from the very heart of dark magic. You'll be trying to gain the most reputation points by fighting these monsters and dragons, liberating places of trade and places for mining, selling natural resources, as well as defeating opposing heroes while controlling a monster. Euthia Torment of Resurrection is for 1-4 to four players, plays in 30 minutes to 2 hours per player, for ages 14 and up, and published by Daya Games. Today we'll be doing a rule school where I'll teach you how to set up and play the game so that you don't have to read the rule book yourself. Now I placed timestamps below me in the description of this video just in case you want to jump to a specific section of the rules. Well, without further ado, let's get started. Euthia Torment of Resurrection is a strategy game for 1-4 to four players that takes 30 minutes to 2 hours per player to play. And you'll be playing the role of one of these awesome heroes. You'll be exploring out and building the world each time you play with different tiles. And as different map tiles come out, you'll be trying to fulfill different quests like bringing a potion to the emissary for reputation and money. You'll be trading with alchemists and merchants and getting all sorts of cool equipment and gear and you'll be equipping that gear, making you stronger in battle. You'll also be finding all sorts of different items, like natural resources at mountains, lakes, caves, and also treasure. Over the course of the game, you're trying to gain reputation, and as you do so, you'll get to unlock and train yourself with abilities that are specific to your hero. You'll also be fighting against cool monsters and using the huge die of hope to help you. Other players will be using these monsters to try to kill you and getting reputation for doing so. And the game comes with multiple scenarios that you can choose that changes how long the game is, some of the rules, and how it ends, like fighting off the giant dragon Faruga. There's multiple different scenarios you can play in this game. For this video, we're going to be focusing on the Faruga scenario. To set up, each player is going to select a hero and place the board of that hero in front of them. They're also going to notate what color that player is, and that's going to be denoted by the background color of these tokens shown on this board. In this case, this is the red player. Based upon that color, you'll be placing a bunch of these different tokens and such next to your hero board. You're going to get two hero dice of your color. The damage marker tokens, action tokens that look like this, interaction tokens, which are double-sided. They have this on one side and they have this on the other. We have trade tokens, shields, and a maximum health marker. You'll then take the maximum health marker and put it so it's pointing to the highest spot that has the blood on it like this, and then you'll take any one shield marker and place it so it's pointing at that current health amount. Next you'll take four guard tokens and place them in the four slots as shown. Next you're going to find all the hero tiles which are again the same color, and you're going to put them in ascending order, smallest on top going larger all the way down the bottom. Now with tiles that have the same number on them, like 2 and 2, it doesn't matter which one you put there, but they're going to continue to increase all the way down. There's also going to be one starting tile, you'll flip this over and you'll place it in the spot that has the corresponding icon. This has a sword, so we'll put it right here. Keep in mind that some heroes start with more than one starting hero tile. For example, if you're playing the hero that is the white color, they have two of them. And the hero with the purple color has three starting hero tiles. Next you're going to find the church healing scroll tile. It has the church on one side like this, and when you flip it over, it looks like this. And you're going to put it in your top sack just like that. Any components for a specific hero's color that's not being used this game can be left back in the box. Next, you'll place a scenario board on the side of the table, but where everyone can still reach it. Randomly select a start player and take one of their shield's colors and place it on the number one here. Then all players will take one of their shield colors and stack them all on zero. This is going to help you track your reputation, which essentially is points in the game. You'll also place tokens that have a 50 on one side and a 100 on the other side. This is in case anyone passes this mark. They can take this to remind them how many total reputation points they have. Next, you'll locate the mining and combat board and also put it off to the side but where everyone can reach it. You'll notice at the bottom there are illustrations for the mountain, the lake, the cave, and treasures. You'll locate all the tiles with those respective illustrations on them, keep them in their separate piles, shuffle them individually, and then place them where they belong. 
Now on the upper half of the board, you'll see places to put different monster cards. We have level one with one sword, level two, and level three. You'll find the cards that correspond with these three different levels, and you'll shuffle those cards in each of their individual piles, and then you'll place those shuffled decks in the corresponding spots. You'll also see a spot for silver and gold cards. You'll find those cards, shuffle them up in each individual deck, and you'll place them in their corresponding spot. Next, you're gonna find the control cards that have this back on them. If you're playing a two-player game, you'll remove all these cards and place them in the box. You won't need them. If you're playing with three or four players, you'll flip those cards over and you'll find the cards that have the colors of the heroes that are playing in the game. For example, in this game, we're not playing with the blue player, so these cards will be removed and placed back in the box. The rest of those control cards will get shuffled and placed in their respective spot. Below this board, you're also going to place the chaos tokens, the guard tokens, and the gem tokens. Now there's actually eight different types of gems and this is what they look like, but you'll put all the gems because there's multiples of each of these type face down here. Next off to the side, you're gonna place the trade board and you're going to find the corresponding tiles for the dragon slayers, the alchemists, and the merchants, shuffle them and place them next to that board. And then you'll flip up four tiles from each section face up in their respective spots. You'll also take the knowledge board, place it off to the side. You'll place this large die of hope here, blank side up. You'll take all of the sack tiles and place them here. All of the potion tiles like this that match this, place it here. And these ones that have the church on the, the back side, you'll flip them over and place them just like that. Next, we're going to build the map. You're going to find the single tile that has a church on it like this. Now, with the scenario that we're playing, you want it to look exactly like this. You do not want to use the side uh, that has the priest here with the question mark. You want to use this other side for this specific scenario. Then you'll sort all the map tiles by their Roman numeral. For example, we have a stack for each of the numbers one through five. Now for each of those stacks individually, you're going to do the following. Now you'll do this individually for each of the stacks, but you'll separate them up into different types. For example, these ones are called fixed map tiles and they have an arrow at the bottom but they also have these two little sort of uh, you know curved spots in the corners i'll also put that logo up here on the screen so you can see in detail all of them that look exactly like that are fixed map tiles there are ones that have that sort of arrow on the bottom but they don't have those little curved uh, spots in the corners up there these are called other map tiles and then you'll find some that have question marks these are called encounter map tiles so for the chapter one tiles, those are the three types that are there. Now, based on this chart, this is specific for this scenario, the Faruga scenario, you'll use a certain amount of tiles depending on uh, the chapter of the tiles that you're going through. And right now we're going through just chapter one. Uh, and we're gonna, let's just say we have four players here. So you always use the fixed map tiles, all of them for each chapter. Then in this case, let's say we're playing four players, we'll choose one of the encounter map tiles. Which means from the two that are actually in here, we'll shuffle them up randomly and we'll use one of these, but we'll throw the other into the box. We won't need it. Then we see other map tiles. That's going to be basically all the other ones that we talked about. And in four players, we would use seven of those tiles. If you're playing with less players, like three players, you would use just six of those tiles in chapter one, for example. So you would shuffle those tiles up and you'd use that many and the rest of them could be placed in the box. So in this case for chapter one, we have them sorted in the different ways that we had them, all the fixed maps, we had uh, you know one encounter, and we had the rest of the others. We're gonna take all these and we're gonna shuffle these all up. So now we have a single chapter one deck. Place this off to the side and you'll do the same thing for the other chapters. Now I also want you to know that chapters four and five have tiles that are called legendary tiles. And this is a legendary tile and you know this because it has one large uh, entity here in the middle and nothing else on it. It's taking up all three hexes. That's a legendary tile. You're gonna remove all of those tiles from chapter four. Now those legendary tiles are also in chapter five. However, in this scenario, you won't be using chapter five so you can take all these tiles and place them back in the box. So we've already set up the chapter one deck and using this table, I'll let you set up chapters two, three, and four for this scenario, just like we did for chapter one, but make sure you keep each of the stacks separate still. So by now you should have the four chapters set up like this. And what you're going to do is place them so that chapter one's on top, chapter two's below, then three and four. So it's gonna go ascending chapters top to bottom. So when you're done, it will look something like this. 
Next, off to the side, you're also going to place the elemental cards. There's four of them and they look like this. You're also going to place essence tokens. Now, these are the four different types of essence tokens. They're the same shape and size as the gems, but they look differently. They look like this. There's gonna be more of these, but these are the only four types that are there. You're gonna find all of those and place them in a supply. And you're also going to find these global effect tokens. They have this die on one side and they have this on the other. Place them off to the side just like this. Next, you're going to set up the encounter cards off to the side. You're going to put them in like kind. So all the cards in this stack have the same illustration that's on the card on the top. However, first we're going to focus on two of these. And those two are the Hunter and the Witch. And they look like these. You're going to go through each of those decks and you're going to separate out the cards that have this single player icon on the bottom left. This means one player. We're playing a multiplayer game, so we're going to take these cards out and place them back in the box. And since the solo game is out of the scope of this video, you'll also remove this entire combat deck which is used in the solo game. So now that we've removed the solo cards from the Hunter and the Witch, there's three other stacks here that we're going to completely remove because they are not used in this specific scenario. Uh, number one is the Adventurer. It has the number four here and looks like this. The Sorcerer, which also has the number four here and it looks like this. And the last one is the Priest, which has number one and is at the church. You're gonna remove all three of those stacks entirely. Now that we've removed those stacks, you're now going to take a certain amount of cards off the top of each of these stacks, remembering that each stack has all of the same cards in it. As shown here, if you're playing a two-player game, you remove the three top cards from each stack. If you're playing a three-player game, you remove two cards from the top of each stack. And if you're playing a four-player game, you remove just one card from every stack. And all those removed cards can go out of the game back in the box. Now also off to the side near those encounter cards, you can place the Hunter Reward Tiles, the Witch Reward Tiles, and the supply tiles. Next off to the side, you'll place all the gold tokens in different denominations, and you'll place the move tokens. There's multiples of these, but they're double-sided and they are between one through four. Also off to the side, we're going to set up the Faruga Scenario cards. This is a deck of Faruga attacks, and this color card you'll notice corresponds with this, and you're going to find the single card here that has the amount of players you're playing with. In this case, if we're playing with four, we'll use this. The ones with three, and two and one can be discarded out of the game for now. And you'll shuffle this deck up. You'll also place these initiative tokens of one, two, and three off to the side as well. And now finally, you'll find that starting tile, the church, and you'll place all the heroes in the game right on that church in the middle of the big tile. The object of the game is to have the most reputation in the end, and you'll be getting reputation in many different ways, and that is gonna be tracked on this board here. And the game is played over multiple rounds. That's also tracked here. Each round, each player is going to be able to take actions and they'll be taking them in clockwise order. At the beginning of each round, each player is going to take one mining, one trade, and one combat token and place it on the corresponding spots on their board like you see here. Now during their turn, players are going to be using these tokens to do different things like moving around and taking mining, trade, or combat actions, and sometimes some free actions as well. So on a player's turn, they're going to take one of these tokens and they're going to move it off the board, and they're going to take one of these actions. In this case, it's moving up to three times or doing a combat action. Now we're on this big tile that has one uh, church in the middle and everyone starts there. Now to move out to one of these other hexes, it costs one movement. So this player is going to move out to here. Now to track your movements, and we have up to three moves, so you would actually put this little one move next to your board to, you know, remind you that you've taken one of your three movements for that action because you can do different things in between your movements. Now, whenever you come to a hex and there are spaces around you, you must fill it in uh, with new tiles. So to place tiles around you, you'll be using that big deck that you had built starting from the top and working your way around, and all the tiles must go in the same direction. This means if you look at the bottom of some tiles and the tops of others, they fit together nicely with the different logos, making sure that everything goes in the same direction like that. Now, if you remember, I've only used one of my movements of the three that I have in this action, so I could do other things or continue to move. Now, there's different types of spots. We'll go over many of these, but these here are portals, and this is where you could actually teleport. If I was to move into here to spend another movement, I could immediately move to any other portal like that. It doesn't cost you anything extra as soon as you move there, you can move somewhere else. You'll have some natural uh, spots here, like mountains, lakes, or caves that you can go to and try to get natural resources. Now you'll notice this tile here has a question mark. Those are some of those encounter tiles that you remember we used during setup. Anytime you bring out a tile that has a question mark, that's an encounter tile, you'll also, from that corresponding deck of encounter cards, 
flip over the top two cards. These are now active quests that people can do. Like for the hunter, for example, it's hunting down monsters. So you could bring a trophy from a bat or a gecko to the hunter, or bring a trophy from the shadow beast or grizzly to the hunter. Now essentially what this means is at some point in the game you might be able to defeat this monster or the bat and you would have this as a trophy and if you bring it back to that space where the encounter is you'll get a reputation which is that star and you'll also get one of these reward tiles there as well. Well let's say we wanted to move to this mountain. Again this would be our second move so we would go here. Now once you're there you can do one of the other actions like a mining action and again these can be done at the mountains, the lakes, or the caves. So we're going to take this mining token and put it down there because that's what we're doing. Now when mining, if an opponent's hero had already mined there, for every one that did, you would have to actually spend one goal and pay that to each of the people that had already mined there. But let's re pretend we're the first ones there. Now, you can only mine if there is not exactly one uh, mining token on there uh, from you. So for example, if it's empty, you can do it. We can put this here. Now that there's exactly one token there, we could not mine in this space again. There's some scenarios that you can actually have two. We'll go over that later on, but as long as there's not exactly one, you can mine there. And then you'll take one of the tiles from where you mine. In this case, we did the mountain, so we will take one of these. Now in this case, I got silver ore, and I could place it here in this sack that can hold an item. Now what this tells me, the, the ore can uh, help me uh, you know, fulfill certain quests throughout the game, but I can always trade it later for three gold and a reputation to get rid of it. We'll go over that trading action a little later. Now we just showed you this action, but when you move there, remember we would have placed another tile here, but I wanted to finish showing you that action first. And look at this, this is a place where you can get treasure. So I could actually spend my third and final movement from my original move to go here and get a treasure. Now before you draw the treasure here, you'll also place one of your hero shield tokens here. This shows that you've gotten treasure here, nobody else can. Plus at the end of the game, as you see, all the shield tokens you put out there, you'll get a certain amount of reputation for those as well at the end. So I would be able to gather one of these treasures and see what it is. And that treasure is an item, so I'll place it in this open spot here, and it's a potion that I can use. And we'll talk more about items and how to use things later. Now, we actually spent movement, and we used this for mining. We have one token left trade. If we wanted to, we could end our turn now. And if we do that, we take the token that we didn't use, move it to this gray spot, because at the beginning of the next round, we're going to be able to fill these back up with tokens, which is actually going to give us more actions next round. Now again, when we moved here, we would have put this tile here, but I wanted to show you how that action worked. But now we have a spot that we could go here. Let's just say we could move there now. Because if you remember, we used our three movement, but I wanna show you how this works if we move into this spot here, because this is a monster, and the monster's on top of a merchant spot where we can actually trade and do some cool things. So if we moved in here, we would have to uh, liberate this of monsters before we could take any other actions on this hex. And keep in mind, we would also place another tile here because now there's some empty spots next to this hero. Now, the number of swords through this monster tells you what level it is. This is a level one monster, and it's showing you the reward. If we beat this monster, we're going to get uh, three coins. Now, keeping in mind, in a normal turn flow, once you've used your actions or chosen one to put there, as I showed previously, it'd be the next player's turn. And remember, in our first turn, we actually used this tile to go to move three and not for the combat because you cannot move into a spot that has a monster if you cannot take the combat action so we're going to assume that we actually have this action here it was a future turn let's just say so we moved into that spot that had the monster and we have the combat in order to try to defeat it now combat is played over a series of combat rounds when the monster and hero will attack each other until the monster is defeated or the hero dies before combat starts, you'll find this die of hope and you'll reset it to zero as you see here. The hero can also change equipment, use items and abilities such as potions and stuff to bring their health up. They can do things like that before combat as well. Now we'll find out who the monster player is. If it's a two player game, it's simply your opponent. If it's a three or four player game, you'll take the top of this control deck and you'll flip it up. In this case, it's me. I can't run the monster because I'm the one fighting the monster. So put this card aside just for now. We'll go to the next card. You'll keep doing that till you have a new card that is not you. In this case, this player is going to be controlling the monster. Now, any cards that were you will actually get shuffled back into this deck. And if at any point in time this deck goes completely empty, you simply shuffle all the cards that have been discarded from previous times going through it. Now, the one running the monster will draw the card of the specific monster. This was a level one monster, so they'll draw that card. Then flip it over and the monster running player would take these. Now, this is silver cards. 
sometimes I'll have them take cards, this one's it's not any. Uh, it's gonna have them take two chaos tokens and one guard token. Now this card also shows how much life this monster has, the Venomous Spider. It also shows how much damage it can do the human based upon dice rolls. Now the combat sequence goes first strike, then a combat round, and then end of combat. Now in first strike, if the hero, this is not us, but showing you that some heroes have throwing weapon spots that they can do, that little throwing axe. And they can equip themselves with items that have that, which means this hero can equip himself with a dragon blade, which is a throwing weapon. Now in this case, if this was the hero attacking in this first strike, they could use this. So in this case, they would roll two dice. If they did seven to 11, they'd damage two to the monster. If they did 12 or more, they would get uh, five damage done to the monster. But that's just to show you that first strike, you can use this. You can also use a first strike ability on some tiles that you may get. Like this blizzard tile says attack first on it. Now keep in mind, if you use a first strike ability like this tile, you'll exhaust the tile by turning it 90 degrees, meaning you can only use it once per turn. However, throwing weapons do not get exhausted this way. Now, as we go into the combat rounds, it starts with the hero preparation. And the hero can do different things. They can use potions and scrolls. And certain gems like opals and diamonds can give you health. And essence like water can give you health. I'm not going to go over all the abilities of all the different uh, you know, gems and essences and such. You can refer to the appendix, which has all these abilities in detail there. After the hero's done in their preparation phase, it's the monster phase. Now, before the monster does their attack roll, they can play certain cards, like we, I told you sometimes they'll have these from previous turns. They can play some of these cards if it has this icon, which has a monster and a left arrow. This means it can be played, you know, uh, right now, during, before the attack roll. And they do different things. Again, there's an appendix that talks about all these, but this essentially adds, uh, allows them to do extra damage if they roll a certain amount. Now, not just these silver cards or gold cards can be used like this. Abilities with items can, be, can possibly have this icon on them. Now, both players can play cards with these types of things. And if there's a question as to who, you know, whose turn it is to play, it's always the player who played previously has to give way to the other player to play something like this. But then you go to the monster attack roll. Let's say they rolled five. They're going to roll their, their own hero dice there. Now, this wouldn't trigger because it was six plus, but they rolled a five, for example. Now when the monster's rolling, if it's between 10 and 12, this die of hope would increase by one, but in this case it's not, so it will stay there. Now after the monster rolls, they can use one of their guard tokens from their board. They would spend this, and this allows them to re-roll any dice and then add two to the roll. Now the hero player can also spend one of their guard tokens, and they can re-roll any of the dice and subtract two from the roll. And both players can spend any amount of guard tokens. Now keep in mind, some abilities might allow the monster player to change this. There's different abilities that allow you to do that. There's different cards, uh, like anything that has the monster with the right arrow can be done after they roll. Now this card will allow you to add to the monster's attack roll, like five, as you see here. Uh, but despite what this card says, uh, you won't be able to take the control of the monster from somebody. This will not be in the final game. But there's different abilities and such where you might be able to change the dice both from the monster side and the hero side. Now again, different things can change the effects, cards, abilities, things like that. But in this case, let's just say they did five. We'd look here, three through nine. It would injure the hero by two. So we will come here and we will go down two. Now we just have four health left. Now at this point, the monster player could play this. Now this is essentially before the uh, hero rolls their dice. They could play a curse, which essentially would cause uh, minus three from the dice roll of the hero player. Or if they played two of these cards, it would take four off the hero's dice and whatever the hero does, it would do one less damage to the monster. Now for things on these cards to take effect, not only do you have to play the card as the monster controlling player, but you also have to play certain chaos tokens as you see there. And keep in mind, they were given a certain amount of these chaos tokens at the beginning of combat. Now at this point, optionally, before they go to the hero phase, the hero can do that preparation phase again, which is anything that has this icon on it. They can drink po uh, potions, use scrolls, and things like that. Otherwise, it's going to go to basically right before the hero uh, rolls their dice. And now it's, you can use anything that has this icon, which is an arrow to the left, like this essence here would, would do plus three more damage to the monster. So anything that has this icon on it, the hero can use right now, right before they roll. Now the hero will now select a weapon or a combat ability. Again, look at all the appendix of the different abilities and weapons that are there. But this is a weapon-based ability. This is a starting uh, sort of starting tile that we showed you. And the hero is going to roll the two hero dice. 
So let's say they rolled a 10. Now this normally 10 plus would do three damage to the monster. But let's say instead of rolling a 10, he rolled the eight. Now he has focus, which this cross icon means it can be used in or out of combat. So we could use this and it would give us plus two to the roll. So it would go from a eight to a 10, getting us from a two uh, damage to three damage. Now, when you use one of these abilities, you will put it uh, 90 degrees because it is exhausted, meaning you can't use it again this turn. But let's say during this phase that we just talked about, it, the hero played one of these essence tokens and it was gonna do a plus three. Now the plus means that you have to, you know, it's gonna do three more than it normally would in this case. And the plus means you would have had to have done at least one damage for this to trigger. Now keep in mind, some heroes might have abilities that allow them to do things after their heroes roll, and that's an arrow to the right. So the damage would get done. In this case, the Staff of Fire did three, and the Essence did plus three, so we were at six. So let's just say we did six damage. Now we'd look at the health here, and this monster is gonna be dead. However, if it was not, let's just say we only did one thing of damage, we'd go back and forth with the combat round of the monster attacking and the hero attacking back and forth until one of them had zero health less left. In this case, let's just say it was the monster that had died. The hero would gain loot from the tile. In this case, it would be three gold. Now gold is kept in this spot on your board just like that. Now you'd flip that monster card over and you might get a reward. If your reputation is between zero and 15, you'd get two reputation and a silver card. That's what you can use for future combat. And you'd gain the two reputation on the track. I know this has a book. We're gonna talk about this later, but every time you get to a book, it gives you some more things that you can unlock for your own hero. We'll go over that later. Now you'll keep that monster as a trophy, but it's too big to fit in a sack. So you just place a shield on there to tell you that it is in that sack. Now by default, you only start with three sacks at the beginning of the game. And if it's full, you need to discard something to make room for it. However, over the game, you'll be able to find a potion case, a scroll case, and a rucksack that will help you hold more things in virtual slots. At this point, you put all used tokens to the supply and all the silver or gold cards used would go to a discard pile. Now, at this point, the hero can still use points from the Die of Hope, which we haven't yet talked too much in detail about, but during combat, the hero can reduce this die by a certain amount to get a certain ability, like by one to give your die plus one, or by two to get a guard token, or by three by getting a plus one and doing one damage to the monster. So right now, even at the end of combat, it says even at the end of the combat, we could get that we would move that down two to one and we can get a guard token. Now, if this combat took place at merchants, which are these sort of red roof buildings here, or alchemists, which is this purple roof building, or if it took place on a dragon slayer tower that looks like this with the three colored towers on it. If it's one of those three, the hero will place one of their trade tokens on there. This marks that this is now liberated and players can move through this and interact with this tile without having to kill the monster. However, if the monster was killed on a mining hex, which again is a mountain, a lake, or a cave, they would instead take two of their uh, mining tokens and place it here. This is just to show them that this has been liberated from the monster. It does not mean that they can't later on uh, be able to actually mine this. Earlier I told you, you, could, you cannot mine it if you have one token, because that means you've mined it before. You can mine it if you have zero tokens, or you can mine it if you have two tokens, because you haven't yet mined it yet, you've just liberated the monster. So if you're on a, a site like this, that you can mine at, and you have two tokens, you'll just take one off, you'll mine it as normal as I showed you previously, because now there's one mining token on there, and you can't do it then, and for the rest of the game on that specific hex. Now, if you kill a monster and it's not on a, a sort of mining hex, and if it's not in one of the trade spots, you would simply put your shield there to show that it's liberated. However, if instead during combat, the hero dies, meaning they get all the way down to the skull and crossbones, you would take the monster that defeated them and place it back on top of the monster deck. Then the chaos tokens and the guard tokens would be placed back in the supply. Any played silver or gold cards will go in discard piles for that respective deck. The person that was controlling the monster will take the shield of the defeated hero and place it on their board. That'll be worth points at the end of the game. The hero will then be resurrected at that start tile where the church is. You then would set your health to the maximum, just like the beginning of the game. You'd restore your health to the maximum. You'd also gain three guard tokens that you place on your board, assuming you have room to place them. And you draw one of the gold cards that will help you in future combat. So let's say we were able to defeat the monster and we were able to put our trade token here. Now due to this situation, uh, the hero is allowed to play a trade action immediately after combat ends and is not forced to discard 
the exceeding items directly right after the combat action, so let's talk about the trade action in general now. Now remember, when doing a trade action, you must be at a merchant, like this tile here, and the monster must be liberated. Same with alchemists, if you were gonna do it anywhere here with a purple roof, it needs to have a monster liberated. And if you're going to a dragon slayer, which is a big tile, any hexes around it that have monsters need to be liberated, and then you can move into the center and do a trade action. Now, if another hero would like to make a trade where somebody else already has, they must pay this player one gold. If they don't have gold, they can sell an item to raise that money. We'll talk about selling items later, but there will always only ever be one trade token from all players on a specific place of trade. Now, there's many options at the places of trade, and a player can use any of these services as many times as they want. One option is to purchase items, and you can do so if you're at the Dragon's Lair Towers, the Alchemists, or the Merchants. In this case, we're at the Merchants. So you would purchase any of these items here, and the large number is what you would buy it for. The smaller number is what you could sell it for on a future trade action back if you're at a place of trade. For example, let's say we had eight coins and we bought this. Now we see this spot here where my board matches this, so this is where we can place this. Now, there's a few things about the armor. Uh, number one is we see this, there's a little gem that we can place here. Now, if we have a gem on our board here, we can now place it on here, effect side up. That's the only way you can essentially use the power of the gems and essentially uh, we can use this power and then we would flip it back down. Also remember when placing a gem like this, it can no longer be sold or be used for a quest. Now we also have that same power here. What does this do? This allows us to raise our max and our health by one point. This actually uh, keeps track of how many sacks we can have. By default, we have three and different effects are going to add or subtract that. And if you're at zero or above, then you can use all three sacks. If you are less than zero, you would take one of these gray sacks off this board and you would place it on one of these sacks, meaning you can't use it. But if you're already full, you would place it on here and the item that you covered, essentially you act as if you just acquired this item, you'd need to figure out what to do with it. Meaning using it, equipping it, or discarding it at this point. And when you buy an item, the next one immediately becomes available. Now, once during a trade for no money, you can discard all four and bring four new ones out. If you want to do this again, all subsequent times cost a coin. And you can get rid of the four that are here and bring ones out looking for what you really need. Now, when equipping different armor, you can collect sets of the same type, and the type is the color. You see this is a yellow background. I have three sets of the same armor. This is a different type of set. So I have three. Certain amulets and abilities have these icons on them, like a triangle or a square or a pentagon. Now this, a triangle means if I have three, a set of three of the same armor, I get to use this ability, which is adding two to a dice roll. If I have four, I can add one damage. So here I have three, so I have this ability. If I get a fourth of this type, I can also use that ability. Now a player can also spend a coin to unveil hero cards or gain five health up to their maximum health. Let's talk about those hero cards. Now on this reputation track, remember we said as you pass these books, certain things are going to happen. Let's say this red player was at a reputation of five. They passed two of these. This means that they're gonna be able to look at values of two and four from their hero cards. And if you remember, their hero cards started with the higher values and went down. So we could reveal all twos and fours. Now we actually have two twos and two fours, and as we can see, the next ones are sixes. When you reveal them, any of them of the same value. So from these two twos, we have to select one of them and discard the rest. Same for the fours. So we have to keep one of these two and keep one of these two and the rest get discarded out of the game. So let's say we kept these two. Now we can purchase these for these costs, a one and a two of coins, of course. So let's say we do so. Now notice over here, now your hero might look different depending on which hero you have, but here is the, mat, the, the sort of crystal ball, and that matches up here. These are abilities. So this could go here if we paid the two coins. And again, that tells you when you can use it as we talked about earlier in combat. Now this one also has that ability. We could place it in one of these, but these are all locked at the beginning of the game. And in order to be able to unlock these, you either have to pay the coins like five, seven, six, or for, or you have to pay one of those essence, essence tokens that you may have already have gotten. Now at the trade, you can unlock one of these by paying one of these two and not putting anything there. And you can place a shield there, letting you know that you've unlocked it for later. But in this case, we will have paid one of these two plus this one, and we can place this here. And now we have this Lords of Portal, so we could teleport to any portal or teleport to an adjacent hex. 
Now this is what we call train abilities, and it doesn't cost anything if I didn't want this one any longer to switch it out with one that I possibly have already revealed. I could put this to the side of my board and put the one that I really want here for that point of time. And keep in mind, when using these types of abilities, you will exhaust them 90 degrees to let you know that you can't use them again that turn. And then they'll end up getting activated again at the beginning of the next game round. Now you'll notice on the right side of your hero board, we have similar things. We have the amulets and rings, which are already unlocked, but all these spots need to be unlocked with coins before we place things there. Now keep in mind, one thing you could do at the place of trade is to sell things. So let's say earlier in the game we had gotten this, but now we really want to sell it. The smaller number there in the parentheses, we could sell this for four coins. However, if you're selling a tile like this that has a gem on it, you cannot sell the gem once it's already placed. But when you sell the equipment, you'll end up selling it for one gold higher for each gem on it. So in this case, we would get one more gold for selling it, which would be a total of five. We could sell this item for one coin, for example. Also, any gems not placed on tiles and any essences here can be sold for two gold each. You cannot sell the Gar tokens. However, if you happen to be at one of the Dragon Slayer Towers, you can buy a Gar token for one coin. And the trading spots are where you would sell items like this to get these rewards. In this case, I could sell this raw ruby to get two coins and two reputation, or I could get two of those gems immediately. Different map hexes have different elemental powers, and they have different icons that are matching with the elemental cards. Now these actually show in every direction an arrow. This means that every hex that surrounds this has this elemental power. If, but if we move here, we can place one of our elemental tokens. This will help us get reputation at the end of the game. Uh, if any other opponents have one already there, we have to pay one gold to each opponent that already has an elemental token there. But then we can roll the dice and do the effects of what the card says. Now, anytime you roll dice on this hex or any hex that's adjacent, meaning we could be here in combat, and this is gonna be affected by this air elemental. Uh, for example, your higher of the two dice that you roll is gonna get flipped to the other side, meaning it's gonna be worse. It's gonna be harder to fight this because of the elemental that's next to it. If you're on a hex influenced by earth elemental, your dice roll will get a plus two. If you move to a hex that's influenced by water, you'll gain one health up to your max. However, you don't get it if you were teleported to that hex. Which also means if you're adding a new map tile and you're next to this and you get a water, you can immediately heal by one. Now, if you move to a hex influenced by fire, you suffer two injuries, which also means if you add a map tile and a hex next to you has this, you'll also suffer the two injuries. And again, on any of these, you can place one of your uh, elemental tokens, roll the dice and follow the directions on the card. Now in summary, on your turn, you're taking these tokens off and doing these actions as everything I've spoken about previously. And once everyone has taken a turn, you will increment this to the next round number. Now at the beginning of your turn, remember, you're going to be placing these tokens back on your board, remembering that if you had not used one before, it's going to be in this gray spot, so this will give you some extra actions. And now if you had any tiles that were exhausted from last round, you can spin them up and make them active again. Now this flow will continue until the end of the 12th round. At that point, Faruga is raiding places of trade and places of encounter, and you're trying to hunt down the dragon, protect the people and their settlements, and defeat the horrific beast by the end of the 14th round, so you have two rounds to try to defeat him. Now to set up the attack round, all players do their normal thing at the beginning of their turn, which is putting tokens back on their board and making any uh, exhausted tiles active again. Now we have the Faruga cards. This one, if you remember, got set up at the beginning of the game, depending on the amount of players. You'll flip it like this so you can see the amount of damage it does and how much health it has. The rest of the Faruga attack cards get shuffled, and then the first one will get placed to face up on the table. This tells you a few things. It tells you where it attacks. In this case, it's going to be the merchants, and it tells you where it's going to attack first, second, and third. You look at the red needle, and this is pointing at south. So the first thing is it's going to hit the furthest south merchant. The second one is going to be east, and the third one is going to be north, because you start with the red, and you go to the other letters just like that. So in this map, we place the first one furthest south, the second one the furthest east in the entire region, and the third one goes in the furthest north merchant space, just like that. Now, if there happens to be a tie as to which is the furthest east, for example, you'll give the tiebreaker to the next direction. So it's the furthest east, that's also furthest north, for example. 
Now in this part of the game, you don't take normal turns, you're just moving to where the attack is and possibly moving to the church. Remembering if you go into a big tile, you have to go to outer hex first and then another movement to go inside. Now at the church, you can spend for each gold, you can get six health back up to your maximum. You can also spend one gold to get one of these uh, healing scrolls, but keep in mind you can only ever have one of these. Now, going in clockwise order, each player is deciding whether they're going to move to the attack spot or not. In this case, it's the first one. Now, you need to use your normal movement in order to do so, the, the movement portions of your tokens. You need to be able to make it there in order to fight there. So everyone would decide whether they are going to get there and fight. And then in clockwise order, each player is going to move, use their uh, tokens to make sure they can actually move there again, also stopping at the church if they like or can do so. Heroes not going to this initiative token can spend movement points on their turn to move towards a future initiative token. Then each hero attacks the dragon and whoever spent the least move points to arrive attacks first. And if it's a tie, you roll a die and whoever has the highest goes first. Now the hero follows the standard combat rules, but you will skip the monster phase. So essentially you're going to do possibly first strikes, Hero preparation and hero phase as talked about previously, you will not use the die of hope at all in this combat. And since there is no monster phase, you can't use any abilities that do things just before or after a monster's roll. As attacks hit Faruga, you'll place the damage markers on them as normal. You'll then suffer injury based upon the Faruga card, in this case, six. Then you'll either get dealt more injuries based upon how much you damage Faruga, or you'll get reputation. For, ex for example, if we had done eight or more damage to them, we would have gotten a reputation, but we did six, so we would actually take three more uh, injuries, so our health would go down by three. Now at the end of that combat round, after all heroes have uh, attacked Faruga, you remove that initiative token and you do this again, moving possibly to the next initiative token. So you'd follow that same procedure for initiative token two and initiative token three. And if Faruga is still alive at the end of those three initiative tokens, it'll be the end of the 13th round. You'd go to the last round of this scenario, the 14th round, you'd set up another three initiatives uh, for Faruga to attack at. And if by the end of the 14th round, Faruga is not dead, you go to Settlements and Fire. And at this point, each hero would lose 10 reputation points. But then each player would still get a certain amount of reputation based upon the amount of damage they did to Faruga. And then you'd go to final scoring. If a hero dies during the Faruga attack, the hero is resurrected in the church. They lose any remaining move points, they lose two reputation, they heal to their maximum, and then they continue playing during the next Faruga attack. Now, as players are placing their own uh, damage tokens there, you're going to be getting close to Faruga's max health of 100. Now, once Faruga is dead, you'll look at how much damage each player did, and they would get this much reputation based upon uh, how much they did there. So, for example, if I had 20 damage there, I'd get 3 reputation. Now, the last blow is called the final blow. When that player is inflicting up to this much total damage, if they deliver damage above that amount, they don't put that extra damage on the card. For example, if Faruga had only 4 health left and you dealt 5, you'd only place 4 damage there. Now that player will get 2 reputation for delivering the final blow, and all players will get an amount of reputation based upon the amount of damage they inflicted. For example, 25 damage would be worth 5 reputation. And then you proceed to final scoring. On your board, you're going to look at your ability tiles and you're going to gain coins for the training costs of these. So two, two, one, and three. You actually gain the gold for that and put it in your gold stash down here. But you then remove these tiles from your board just like this, but you've gained that gold. You'll also gain gold for any unlocked spaces like this one. This would get you four more gold. But you also had unlocked this and this, so you'd get five and seven gold as well. You'll then get two gold for every gem and essence that's on your board down here. You'll also get two gold for any gems that are on your tiles, but you do not get any uh, gold if you have any ability tiles that have essence on them. For each equipment card still on your board, you take the gold equal to the purchase price and you remove them from the board. So 13, 2, 8, 2, 12. And also any spots that you unlocked, you'd get coins as well. Also, any slots that you've unlocked from your equipment side, you'll get coins for as well as shown. If you have natural resources on your board, you can take the money for the selling cost to gold, but don't remove it from your board yet. Because you can take this reputation as well right now, and then you're gonna get one reputation for every five gold that you have. Now to remind you, all those steps are here on the top of this board where it says scoring. 
then you're gonna get a certain amount of reputation depending on the amount of things that are out on the board from you. For example, if you have four to six hero tokens, which are the shields of yours, you'll get two reputation. If you have between seven and nine, you'll get five. Now for the interaction tokens, these are elementals and mining hexes. You're going to get them depending on the certain amount there. The amount of trade tokens are essentially the liberated merchants, alchemists, and hexes around the dragon slayer towers. Other heroes tokens, if you remember, you'll get a token from another player, their shield, if you defeat them when you're controlling the monster. So depending on how many other opponent tokens you have, uh, one, two, three, or four, you'll get that much reputation. And the player that lost these tokens in combat will lose two reputation for each of their tokens lost this way. And then for this many fulfilled quests, you'll get that much reputation. And whoever has the most reputation at that point is the winner. If it's tied, you'd look at the silver and gold cards in hand of those tied players. Each silver card is worth one, while each gold card is worth four. If there's still a tie, the winner must be determined by another battle for the fate of Euthia. Well, I hope this helped you dive right into Euthia, Torment of Resurrection, and get to the fun quicker than you normally would if you had to read the rulebook yourself. Now, if you have further questions about the rules, I placed the link below me in the description of this video, and that's the best place to ask them, because not only will I be notified, but so will Daya Games.